Okay. Uh, LinkedIn Live and a 30-minute session go fast. And I'm going to be moving fast. I get that I'm going to be talking at a high level and from a fire hose kind of a way. If you've got questions, feel free to ping me. Happy to talk to you individually. Happy to, to talk to your company about this. Um, but this is designed to be a fast-paced uh, set of tips. And so the first tip I want to put in your mind is when you're trying to achieve any revenue goal, $10 million, $1 million, $1 billion, you need to have that goal very clearly in your mind. And then you need to be able to articulate that goal to everybody else who's around you, your colleagues, some of your teaming partners, um, the people who are your mentors, whether it's you know P-Tax or actual board advisor type people. You need to make sure everybody who cares about the success of your company is aware of your goal. And I understand that for some of you who are listening to this video and listening to me give these tips, I'm going to talk a little above some of you and a little below some of where you guys are at. That's fine. Just adjust with me and um, and we'll all be kind of cruising through this, this tip together. So I, I wanted to first point out my opinion when I look at goals is that there's revenue goals and there's sales goals. Revenue goals, basically, how much money am I getting in this year? That's revenue. And, and, and I don't care about all the fancy uh, different ways of describing revenue. Revenue to me as a business owner has always been how much money is in my bank account. Um, I learned this from my sister-in-law a long time ago, actually, about uh, she got like, I don't know, $100 million in VC funding. And then something happened and it came out for a couple of days. And we all come up with this lesson that says until that money is in our bank account, it's not real revenue. I know I know accountants and CFA, CFOs and everybody else say it differently. But you have a revenue goal. How much money do I want to make? And then a sales goal. Sales goal isn't about this year's revenue. It's about this year, next year, five years out, depending on how big that um, opportunity you're going after. And so just understand when we're looking at your goals, determine what you're looking for. Today, I'm thinking about a $10 million revenue goal as I try to get to that stage. And so in your own mind right now, for your own company, think to yourself, do I know what my 2022 revenue goal is? Is it clear in my head by the end of uh, December when I'm getting ready to file my business taxes and I say, how much money did you make? Well, here's how much money we brought in because that's what you're paying taxes on basically. Do you know what that goal is? Do you already have it defined for 2023? I recently did a five-year um, strategy one-pager LinkedIn Live event where I walked through how you kind of set it out for five years and you're just incremental, incrementally moving forward. But you should have an idea of um, out years for your revenue goals because that helps you with your sales goals. Um, and this goes to that third bullet. Revenue goals lead to sales goals, meaning um, as you look at this example I have, if I want in 2023 calendar year, and let's say I have a um, January to December fiscal year for my company, so calendar year, I have $10 million uh, I want to make next year. That's additional. I call it new revenue, right? Independent of all the ups and downs of my existing revenue. I want to add uh, $10 million in revenue. In order to achieve that, I need a sales goal of 50 million. These are loose numbers, right? Because we're doing a quick LinkedIn Live. But the idea is that if you look over on the right, um, if you're going to expect $10 million in revenue next year from sales that are happening this year, then generally in the federal government space, you're getting five-year contracts, right? A base plus four years, sometimes a little less, sometimes they're eight-year contracts, but five years is a good average in the federal space. And so when I look at a $10 million revenue goal, that means I need to make at least $50 million when in sales this year that start January 1st um, or earlier for, for the next year, FY23, or excuse me, CY23. And um and then those five years, that 50 million will be broken up of five years. I'll get 10 million each year. Does that make sense? Um, you want to do that same kind of math when you're a smaller company as well. Say you're trying to just add a million dollars. I know companies that are a $3 million firm. It's realistic for you to expect 100% growth in the federal space, but it's far more um, prudent to plan for, let's say, a 30% revenue growth. Your stretch is 100%, but 30%, that means you're only looking to get a million dollars. Well, in order to get a million dollar sale, you need five million dollars, excuse me, million dollars revenue. You need five million dollars sales. Hope that makes sense. It's a very quick way of looking at being clear about your goal and the difference between revenue and sales goals. By the way, if you have questions, put them in uh, uh, in comments down below, put them in and I'll try to look at them after uh, this event. I'll definitely get back to you. So let me give you tip number two about um, 
how to achieve a $10 million new sales, right? Is when you look at where are you getting the money, understand that there are three ways to make money in the federal space. Um, I've talked about this a lot and I really like teaching things where I, I minimize the complex. Uh, you know, you might look at the government, you say there's all these things, but if you sold products, it doesn't matter if you sell it to the government directly or through a partner, that's still fitting into this. If you do construction, manufacturing or services in the federal space, you're only doing it one of uh, three ways. And I actually um, broke it into three ways, but it's subcontracting with small businesses, priming with federal agencies or subcontracting with large primes. And the reason I break it there is because in my opinion, this is the small business maturity path. When you're going from just starting out your first three, $5 million, you should be down, uh, not down, but you should be focused on getting revenue from small business subcontracting. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, as you mature as an organization, then you can expect to get money from agencies as a prime contractor. Hey, we have this past performance in your agency as a sub, we'd like to go after small priming. They'll be open to it, right? Uh, you'll have security clearances, all that stuff. So now you're ready, you're procurement ready to work with the agency as a prime contractor. And then larges have a much lower risk threshold than smalls or agencies. Um, they have a lot more concerns actually. Um, and so to me, they're the last group you should be trying to get money out of uh, as you mature, right? There's always exceptions, but they're the last group you, you um, go after because they all want to see that you've got experience being a teammate. I did it under the subs. They'll want to know you have experience working with the federal government and understanding the compliance that's required to manage a contract that they would have to do and that you would have to support them doing as a subcontractor. They have all this other concerns about making sure you have enough money and you're properly protected, that you can hire the right people. Well, if you've worked with smalls as a subcontractor, if you've worked with agencies as a prime, then the large businesses will think, okay, so you've got the experience um, we need. And just like before, they will incrementally move you up from 100,000 to a million to 10 million to a bazillion dollars in subcontracting, right? Everything is a path. Remember, no um, no magic bullets here. Right? It's, it's steady growth. And so over on the right in that box, what I was trying to suggest here is that when you think about the three different ways to make money, break down how you're going to get your 10 million. From now on, you adjust that 10 million up or down to fit your actual revenue goals. But how are you going to get that $10 million? And what I would suggest to a $20, $30 million firm that's going after $10 million in new revenue next year is that the way you get your money is to split your efforts up among these three uh, revenue streams is what I call them or channels, right? And so I would be looking to build relationships with small business contractors. If I'm in the IT space, I absolutely will be teaming up with 8A small businesses because they've got the direct award um, advantage that's in there. I would be finding 8A stars three because that's a $50 billion uh, ceiling IT uh, contract vehicle. And um, it's just fresh. So I'd be teaming up with them. They would appreciate maybe working with me because of what I can bring. And I would appreciate working with them because they have access to vehicles, et cetera, that I might not have. And you can look around to other smalls. Maybe you're looking at a small that doesn't have any tag, but what they have is a really strong private presence in the Air Force, if that's a target agency of yours. And so look in there and go, okay, I want to get three and a half million there, basically, right? Easy numbers. Um, same thing with agency primes. Now you're a a uh, firm that's doing 20, 30 million, you easily could be priming. You probably all, already are priming. Well, to grow, you only need uh, three and a half million to hit that $10 million mark if you do it in the three ways. By the way, for anybody asking, of course, I'd be aiming for more dollars coming out of the agency prime, but that's just the size of my pipeline. My expectation though, is each one of these revenue streams need to deliver me three and a half million dollars so I can spread out or diversify my efforts. The reality is I'll be more than happy if I get 10 million just out of one of these channels. But when you spread it out, you begin to balance the load that you're doing. And I'll talk about that in the next tip. Um, so small business subcontracting, you're aiming for relationships to do that. Priming, you're targeting a specific agency and saying, I'm going after three and a half million dollars in the Air Force in this major command with this particular core competency or skill set that I want to build up. I want to go after their cloud work or I want to go after their new construction. Whatever it is, you target the agency and you go after the opportunities that are 100% within your space. 
Um, and, and I'm going to go to the large business in one second. But one thing to keep in mind is that um, everything I'm talking about requires that you focus on a core competency. And I don't care if you're a $50 million firm, you need to have a core competency, set of core competencies that are related, that that's what you're going after. So everybody on your team knows what you sell. All your marketing material is really driving towards the same message. All the opportunities you're going after are solidly aligned with your core competency and your past poor perfor performance. All of that together means you'll win or you have a likelihood of winning that's higher than if you go after unrelated stuff. So make sure you don't get um, distracted by shiny objects. So the last um, revenue stream is large businesses. I would be looking into a large business. Um, you can build relationships, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, with key business developers or capture leads within a large prime um, that are going after certain agencies, pursue that. You could also knock on the door of uh, the program managers who run large multi-billion dollar contract vehicles where they're generally trying to look for um, other businesses to work with in particular small businesses. How can they use them in there? Well, a program office or program manager over a contract vehicle isn't responsible for the work. He, they've got all sorts of program managers for each one of the task orders. Um, and so for these folks, their job is to manage the contract vehicle. They're aware of all the task orders that are coming through. And they have a, a peer uh, person who manages the con their contract administrator for that IDIQ. Anyways, you can go in there and begin to develop the relationships. But um, when you come back to it, when you're trying to pursue $10 million, don't think to yourself, I'm trying to pursue $10 million out of this one path. Because if the one path fails, then you're out of luck. But if you give yourself multiple paths, so for example, if you're going after agency primes, you don't go after one three and a half million dollar contract. You go after 10 three and a half million dollar contracts over the next 10 months, 12 months, right? If you're going after um, small business subcontracting, you want to spread it out there, but you also want to make sure you have spread yourself across all three. One last tip here, uh, I mean, one last point on this tip is that it's the same person who could be doing all of this uh, activity in a particular swim lane. So let's use the Air Force as an example. Agency priming, a business developer and capture lead who's focused on the Air Force, right? They've got that bullet. They can also identify subcontractors that are large and small that are in that space, right? If I'm trying to build up my revenue, I'm not looking for companies that have no past performance. I'm happy to work with them as a sub of mine. But if I'm looking to build up revenue as a subcontractor to somebody else, I want them making a decent amount of uh, revenue in the government already. And so if I'm going after the Air Force, as a BD or capture person, I'm also building a relationship with smalls that I can be their subcontractor. And I'm building a relationship with larges that I can be their subcontractor. If they're not willing to do it, then they're not a good strategic partner. They might be a good one-off partner, but they're not a good strategic partner for my long-term revenue goals to try to make $10 million, right? Okay. Um, hey, I want to take a quick water break actually, but really quick, um, tell me how you learned to sell. I, I spent 30 years in um, well, in government contracting business, but for 30 years as a salesperson. And I've gone to a lot of formal sales training, um, business to consumer and business to business and business to government. Um, some people, they'll learn on the job. A lot of us in the federal space, we come in, we got the job and we're just learning. We go to conferences, we meet people, whatever. Um, and then there's the rest of us who do formal sale, selling, selling. Do me a favor, in the comments, just let me know. I'd like to see the balance of the people who are watching this. How many of you who feel like your sales experience comes mostly from OJT on the job? Put OJT in the comment. And then um, the rest from formal sales. Like how many of you actually have been to classes or, or multiple conferences where the purpose of the conference is to teach um, you sales skills, et cetera, and you've done many of those. If you've done that path, put formal in the comments. fun part about these LinkedIn lives is that they're very rapid and we do them every day. <clears throat> and, um, and I try to keep them focused, but it does, it does make me thirsty. Okay. So I'm um, hoping you're putting OJT or formal in. I'm going to come down to the third and final tip here for us today is um, in order to achieve uh, $10 million consistently, make $10 million consistently in revenue. Third tip I have for you is that you need to understand the numbers. Uh, we often call it reverse engineering from a sales or revenue goal all the way back to the phone call, right? And so here I just want to talk about a couple 
of bullets. The first one is to remind you that sales is a numbers game. Um, in sales, I have this uh, phrase that I like to remind myself of, some will, some won't, so what? And what that means is some people will take my calls, some people won't, so what? Some people will um, award me a contract, some people won't, so what? The, the idea of the so what is don't let the, the ones that don't give you a contract bring you down. Just keep doing the numbers game and you will find that you're getting more contracts being won. The key about numbers to remember is you want to look at them. And so if I find that um, my some wills are pretty small and I've got a really big some won'ts, then I need to look at what am I doing? And so I begin to adjust them. They don't have to be disproportionate. They should be balanced, um, you know, a fair amount out there. And so one of the things I might look at is, am I writing proposals that relate to op, uh, requirements that I don't really serve? Are they, is the opportunity um, scope aligned to my core competency? That's a really good example, right? Forget about price and all these other things until you sit there and make sure your business developer and capture people are finding opportunities that are in your sweet spot. Excuse me, when um, when I had my last company, it was SharePoint. I didn't touch any opportunity, it wasn't SharePoint. And when I went after it, I knew that every single time we wrote after it, those people who were evaluating us would have a hard time because they would have us as a winner. They might have other winners, that's how it works, but guaranteed they'd look at us and say, these guys know SharePoint. And that's what I want you to do when I say focus on your core competency, making sure that the, the numbers game you're playing is um, driven by core competency alignment to the scope. Okay, so I put down this um, kind of scenario here, two scenarios. First one is I think everybody should write four proposals a month and uh, certainly every company that's doing 10 million plus, 20 million plus, you should be at this level. When you're smaller, it takes time to get to this rhythm. I am absolutely a numbers game. And here's the thing, if you if you bear with me on how this is possible. First off, you can see the numbers where I put it down, right? Three of the opportunities, if I'm going to write 48 proposals a year for a month, three of the proposals are going to be subcontracting, where there might be five or 10 task areas and I can fit one or two. And I'm on that team and I'm subcontracting. I don't have to do really any of the heavy lift. If they look for me to help them with a little bit of the capture activity, I can help them with a little bit of it, but their capture person is the lead. Their proposal manager is the lead. They've got all that responsibility. Their contracts administrator, their um, whole, uh, most of the work on winning the proposal is with them. And I don't wanna get into a debate on how, how much each help each other. My point is if all I'm doing is taking a small portion of a opportunity, 20% or something, then I just need to deliver to the prime the best content possible to make their proposal winning, at least in these two task areas. I need to make sure the price I give them is highly competitive and highly profitable to me, right? And so three subbing opportunities, it really doesn't take me a lot of time in a given month. Um, and here's why it doesn't take a lot of time, because all I focus on is selling Microsoft SharePoint or Office 365, which is a Microsoft SharePoint platform, if you will. And, um, if I do that, well, the minute I write one, five, 10 proposals or RFIs that are talking to this, I've got a body of repeatable material. I can write a 20 page response in a day using mostly repeatable stuff and then take uh, the next day to write. And if I wrote as a prime, I would take the next day and write 20% to drive towards a particular um, uh, agency specific set of information. Now I'm not trying to take a proposal and say it should be done that fast. My point is I have the content that's available. I would certainly take the time to develop um, capture and winning proposal um, type activity in there. Sticking with this number though, one prime contract. So I should be trying to write one prime contract. If you're not at this level, you're not at this level and don't worry about writing 12 prime contracts in a year. Start getting to one every two months or one every three months and then get to this stage. But the numbers game is if you're writing 48 proposals in a year that are in your sweet spot, you should be winning 12 out of uh, 48 of those, right? And this is my opinion that one out of four of the proposals you write uh, should be able to win. If they're not, you got to look at it. And, and again, I'm not trying to get into this big debate on it. What I'm trying to do is just give you this numbers game. And if you've got multiple uh, proposal writers, multiple capture people, then this is nothing. Okay, so coming down to that next one of strategic partner management. 
Um, in this particular case, how do you find those subcontracting opportunities where you can be writing three proposals a month where they're the prime and you're um, focused on your core competency here? The reality is you just have to build relationships. And I've got all sorts of content that talks about how to build relationships um, with other people, in particular with teaming partners. How do you start those relationships? How do you decide on who to go out there? Um, so go take a look at that if you want to do deep dives. You, you know, maybe somebody drops it into the chat or you can find it on our um, YouTube channel. Um, anyways, the point is when you're building relationships, I use the number of 20 key partners. If you have 20 key partners, then you're guaranteed that you're managing. And these are strategic partners. These are people who have as much interest in growing your company together with theirs as you do. And so that means, hey, we're both going to go out to the Air Force. We're both going to go out to this type of work. You bring that core competency. I bring this. If you have 20 and, um, and you're just trying to get to 28 or 48 proposals in a year, that means each of these have to do just two proposals, um, two proposals in a year with you. If you had 20 partners and you try to get on two team opportunities with them each over the year, then you'd hit that number. And so I come down into some quick numbers and I'm looking at the time. So I'm going to wrap this pretty fast. But every two weeks or excuse me, every month, there's 168 working hours, let's say uh, 40 hours a week times four. So I don't know how I came up with 168. But um, anyways, you have 168 hours. If you meet with everybody for just one hour every two weeks, twice a month, then that's a one hour commitment twice. And what I did is put another hour on it for preparation and post activity. Like, let me do action items. Let me prepare for the meeting. But really you're spending four hours of commitment on the relationship. This is not on capture tasks or anything else. This is just on managing the relationship. So John knows who I am. Jane knows who I am. I know what's important to her. She knows what's important to me. And eventually we'll get on teams together. Um, if you make that commitment to try to build yourself up to 20 strategic partners and get into a rhythm of managing that activity, then it's only 80 hours out of a month. Now, here's the thing I really want you to pay attention to. This is a $10 million a year goal that I was talking about. If you're trying to make $10 million, there's a good chance you've got two, three um, salespeople, business developers, capture leads. Well, you take these 20 relationships and you can divide it. And now they're doing 10 apiece, six, seven apiece. And that's so doable for people. The hard part for us is the discipline to stick with it. 